I am all woman. When I walk towards the public toilet door, I feel the tension begin to rise. Sweaty palms, a nervous fear, like I am in the wrong. About to go somewhere I shouldn't be. The looks I receive, the double takes, the times the question, are you a boy or a girl, resurface. The two times the toilet door was kicked in on me, no questions asked because someone thought there was a boy in the toilet. Ain't I a woman? Hell yeah, I'm all woman. My cheekbones high, my hip bones wide, my teeny tiny bosoms. But what some people see is my short blonde hair, my musty physique, my choice of male gendered clothing. How people see me is not the same. I'm not that model of white, middle class, cisgendered, overtly feminine woman we are told is the true representation of woman. This lens we have been encouraged to view and assess women against needs to be broken. At the moment, not everyone sees me the same, but I am all woman. I am strong in mind and body. I am all woman. I am kind, caring and nurturing. I am all woman. As a lesbian, I love being a woman in a relationship with another woman. I am all woman. Equity for women needs to come from a place of embracing all women. The images we see and use in the media need to be more widely representative. When we normalise more forms of what it means to be a woman, even more women will benefit from equity for women. This year's theme for International Women's Day was equity for women. And what I think is that we need to make sure that that's equity for all women. As we can see, our differing socio-political backgrounds mean that our experience in this life as women is not one and the same. We have different experiences and I think it's really important to bring that out. I think it's really important to raise that awareness so that more women can benefit from equity for women. My speech was based on a speech by Sojourner Truth in 1851, who delivered the talk at the 1851 Women's Convention in Akron, Ohio. In this speech, she makes that connection that actually our experiences as women from different backgrounds can be very different. I'm not going to play you the full speech, but if you want to go and look for it, you can find it on the Internet. I'm just going to play you this little excerpt. But what's all this here talking about? That man over there says that Women need to be helped into carriages and lifted over ditches and to have the best place everywhere. <laughs> Nobody ever helps me into carriages <laughs> or over mud puddles or gives me any best place. And ain't I a woman? In psychology, we have a theory called schema theory. And I think this is one of the reasons I get misgendered quite a lot. As I alluded to in my speech, I think I have quite feminine, biologically feminine features. Um, and I think people miss these all the time. Uh, uh, they just look for that wider schema, like short hair, muscly physique, male gendered clothing. The thing is, I think we really need to remember that um, gender like that, like clothes don't have a gender. That's a social construct. We have given that meaning to clothes. If you think about skirts, so we see that as a meaning for women, that women, only women wear skirts. But if you think about the kilt, for example, and in other cultures around the world, there is other dress that men wear that would maybe look like a skirt, but it, we haven't given, they haven't given it that gendered reference. And this is where I think it's really important and part of kind of breaking things down is, is starting to question things like this. Now I'm coming at it from my perspective and that doesn't kind of represent every every woman's perspective that fit, falls out of side of that normal uh, ideal of women that we are encouraged to see. Um, but I just wanted to use my experience as a way to kind of get you to think about this and we can start to open up and think about it from other perspectives as well. So with regard to the schema theory, uh, when I did this in person, uh, I had people shout out. So you can shout out at home if you want or just kind of say it in your head. But I'm just going to put some symbols up and you kind of shout out what we think we've got there. So here we go. All right. Now, what did you go with this one? So I was really pleased on the evening. Actually, I got the two kind of answers that I wanted. So there was definitely at least one person that shouted out man. And there was at least one person that shouted out person. But I think in general, this type of figure we quite often represent as man. If you think about toilet doors, we have this symbol that represents man. And we have a woman appearing to wear a skirt or a dress that represents woman. But like I say, remember that these are social constructs. Like those are not typical like we don't not every man is going to look like that little symbol and not every woman is going to look like the other little symbol I can tell you there are no dresses or skirts in my closet 
Um, I did I did wear a ball gown and high heels once. Apparently when I stood still, I looked quite pretty. Um, walking about with my gait though, um, apparently not so much. But there we go. And this leads me on into, uh, there's a really interesting book called Invisible Women, which if you've never had a read, I do recommend. It's probably a good one to kind of just dip in and out of chapters as you go. Um, but in that book, the author talks about the um, generic masculine. And I think this is one of the problems. The generic masculine has become such a thing that... Um, like these little icons we kind of see that as man and i think that then that skews our views of what it what it means to be a man and also what it means to be a woman and then i would argue like i say with that, that with the female symbol it would have been interesting if i'd pop this one up what people would have said would we have said personal or would we have said woman um, and I think, again, we need to challenge our thoughts around this um, because not everybody looks like those symbols when we um, get them to mean that it's male and female. How do we then differentiate between toilets? Just write male and female on them, maybe. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I think it's really important to think about this and to think about breaking down these kind of stereotypes and schemas that we build in our minds when it comes to people. One of the things I wanted to do in this talk was to bring out some feminist authors. Um, so if you have seen them before, great. Uh, maybe it's like a recap. And if not, maybe go away and have a little look afterwards. Um, now, I'm still uncomfortable using the word feminist. I think, yeah, people might think of me as some like, ah, rah, feminist, gonna like hit some men over the head or um, be a man hater or something. And that's certainly not me. Uh, I'm definitely a lover, not a fighter. Uh, and I definitely believe in uh, seeing the good in all people. But anyway, I wanted to kind of bring some of these out because I think I think they're really good to kind of think about and go away and have a little look at. So the first one is Peggy McIntosh. Uh, she was part of a women's network. And in 1989, in that women's network, there were some women of colour who spoke up and basically raised the point that their experience of being a woman was very different to the white middle class women who were running these women's networks. And that really challenged Peggy to go away and think about all the ways in which her skin colour didn't prevent a barrier to opportunity for her. And so she wrote this list out of all the ways that her skin colour provided her a privilege, basically, hence the term white privilege. And although this is about race, I think it's really pertinent because it did come out of the women's movement. And it's kind of the point of the talk that I'm giving today that actually, if we want equity for all women, we need to think about women in all all the forms that make us women. And we are not all the same. We are not one model of what it means to be a woman. And so I think this is a really good piece. Um, some of the points I think probably are less relevant today, but I think there's a lot in there that are still relevant. And I think just by reading through it, you can kind of get the idea of what I'm trying to put across here. And if we just have a little look at two of these, I can be sure that my children will be given curricular materials that testify to the existence of their race. Now we can expand that out beyond race as well. And also I can easily buy posters, postcards, picture books, greeting cards, dolls, toys and children's magazines featuring people of my race. And again, we can extend that out. But I think these two in particular, if we look at what we see, representations in the media, representations of what we see within academia and within education, we're still lacking. Um, and uh, at the women's event the other night, uh, somebody brought up about a quiz and I think it was all uh, male uh, the, the quiz was centred around all male answers, I think it was. Um, and so it was really interesting. And I, and I still wonder about whether we get a fair representation of things like female scientists, female authors, uh, female leaders within education, um, and then therefore out into the wider media. I think something that's really important to also raise is that I feel like we have come into a time where equality politics masks the underlying issues. And what I mean by that is we've got policy and legislation that is helping us towards equity. And I think that that's given people a comfort bank blanket to make us think that these issues don't still exist. And I, and I think that's that's a really difficult place to be because these issues are still there. We still have got these different ideals um, in this context of what we think it means to be a woman. And that still permeates our, permeates our culture and means that some people are more disadvantaged than others. And this is where I think it's really important to think about this stuff. And although it's great to have policy and legislation, I think it's important to remember that we, we can't just kind of uh, lay back and rest back on that. But we still need to be educating ourselves and making sure that um, our experiences as women and women with different backgrounds, each woman out there is different. And it's important to recognise that and make sure that we can create spaces for equity for all women.
Somebody else's work that I really like is Kimberly Crenshaw. She coined the term intersectionality, and this means the convergence of all of our socio-political background that make us us. So if we had a group of women, it would be what makes us different, although we are a group of women all together. And I really like her work around this, and it's definitely worth going and having a little look at if you've not come across her work before. But I'm just going to read a couple of her quotes and hopefully you'll see uh, why I've brought her work to the fore. So sexism isn't a one size fits all phenomenon. It doesn't happen to black and white women in the same way. If you don't have a lens that's been trained to look at how various forms of discrimination come together, you're unlikely to develop a set of policies that will be as inclusive as they need to be. There are many, many different kinds of intersectional exclusions, not just black women, but other women of colour, not just people of colour, but people with disabilities, immigrants, LGBTQ people, indigenous people. And this is why I like Kimberly Crenshaw's work, because it really challenges us to think about all of those converging socio-political backgrounds that make us who we are. So yes, as a collective, as a group of women, we are a group of women, but our own social political makeup makes us very different and unique in our experience of this life. And therefore, I think it's really important to, um, one, listen to the experiences of a wide variety of women and ensure that there are policies, procedures and environments and spaces that mean that we can create equity for all women. I found this little thing on the uh, on the International Women's Day website. And I don't know if you've seen. There is a meme on um, social media, but it's like a baseball a baseball game, and it's a very similar thing. But the, imagine like a fence, uh, so a fence at a particular height, and basically on the equality side, um, the the shortest person, even though equality means they've been treated the same, actually they still weren't able to see over the fence. Whereas with equity, it's not about treating people the same, giving them equal things. It's about giving everybody that equality of opportunity is how I would kind of frame this. So it's not about equality, treating everybody the same and making everybody equal. It's about equity, which is about allowing and making sure we know what different people need to be able to give them that same access to opportunities. And so I thought this was a, a, a really good point to bring out because I do really like this. And I think it's a good thing to think about, especially if we are thinking about creating spaces within our own work environments where we create equity and not just equality. What can we do? So these are just my kind of suggestions is I think that we can educate ourselves. And one of the reasons that I threw in a, a couple of different authors into this talk is for anybody that's not read up on any of this stuff. There's some free free education for you right there to go and have go away and have a little look at and take that reading and that learning further and see what you can find out. I also think it's really important to work in ways that promote representation for all women. So not just thinking about women in a particular model or a particular light. It's about thinking about how how do we work to make sure that all women are represented. And I think it's really important also to create spaces that challenge all forms of bias and provide psycho psychological safety for all. I think something that's really important for me is it's not about bashing men over the head in terms of um, rights for women. It's about educating on both sides and also creating spaces that are, are, are kind and caring towards everybody in that situation so that we can all learn together and move forward more positively. I'm a big believer that if you come along to an event or a talk, it's really important to not just listen, but think about something that you're going to go away and do at, at the end of this. So what's one action that you can go away and do from listening to this talk today? What can you do to choose to help create equity for all women in your working life, in your social life, in your family life? What things can you go away and do? And it can be from the smallest thing of just going and reading one of those authors that I've listed today in this talk. Or it could be something bigger. You go and work on a women's project somewhere. Um, but have a little think. I think it's really important. It's not just about raising that awareness and that consciousness. What can you go away and do? What have you been inspired to go away and do as, as a result of listening to this talk? Thank you very much for your time. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to get in touch with me. Thanks a lot.